Acts chapter 4 this morning. I'm going to start back and we're going to be in 13 through 31. I'm going to go back and start in verse 5 so that we can remember where we came from. Acts 4, starting in verse 5. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of, of the people and elders... If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may be spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. (laughs) But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats. And grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders and perform through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with all boldness. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for for your gathered church this morning, Lord. I I pray that as we look to the scriptures, we see the persecution that came against Peter and John, who were being obedient uh, to proclaim your word, who were filled with the spirit as they as they were persecuted, Lord. And and they responded faithfully according to your word. And, And Lord, I pray that 
as as we look to this, that that we would look and see how they responded to persecution, that we may grab hold of this, Lord, and that we may go forth uh, because of your word, changed by it, uh, charged by it, comforted by it. It's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen. Chapter four already. Moving right along. Chapter one, if I had to summarize it, I would say it was the equipping of the disciples, the equipping of the apostles as, as uh, Jesus had instructed them uh, to wait. We saw the ascension of Jesus. He gives them instructions. They're not real clear, but they will be soon, right? As we move into chapter two, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that Jesus had promised. Um, and they begin to, to, to speak the works of God in the native languages of those who were gathered in Jerusalem, a great sign, and 3,000 were added to the church that day. And in chapter 3 opens, we see Peter and John walking into the temple. They see this lame man that's, that, that's still in the context here today, this beggar, right? He's sitting at the beautiful gate. Uh, everybody knows this man. Everybody's seen him sitting at the gate. He's lame, never walked likely, um, and, and he's been a beggar for many, many years. And, and so Peter tells him, he says, silver and gold have I none, right? He catches his attention. He says, but what I have, I give to you. Get up and walk in the name of Jesus. And he, he does. He's healed. It's, it's a miraculous sign that verifies all that, that Peter is about to proclaim. And this crowd is drawn and Peter preaches Christ crucified, right? And so, and so this is, this is, this is not this is not good for the Jewish leaders of the day. This is this is uh, this is not good for their system of, of of corruption they got going on. Right? They they must put a stop to it. They can't have anybody preaching in this name because they just murdered this Jesus. And so that's where we find ourselves today in chapter four, is we see the first persecution of the church. That's the title this morning, the first persecution of the church. And just because James had a second line on there, I just added a call to proclaim Jesus boldly. So that was, that was extra. So, you know, persecution in the Christian church began in these verses, and it has continued and will continue until the Lord returns. Right? Persecution will always be a part of, of, of Christianity as long as, as, as there are people here and Christ has not returned. There will be persecution. There will be those who hate and oppose Jesus. Persecution uh, varies in degree from, right, from threatening speech, uh, from mockery to, to hateful words, to even death and martyrdom. And we'll see that in a few chapters, right? As Stephen is stoned to death, a faithful deacon and witness to Jesus uh, so it varies. Um, some of us have likely faced mild persecution in, in some way or another because of our faith. However, right, we live in a country that was built upon Christian principles and, 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 and morals. Uh, and a common grace blessing has come because of that. Right. So compared to other countries, even today, our persecution is not always as, as bad as what it is is what it could be, right? And as you all know, this country is, has kind of abandoned or is abandoning these principles and morals that we have been built up on, right? The federal government is, as well as uh, state and local governments uh, are, are in, in, in a lot of cases are punishing good and rewarding evil versus what they're supposed to do, reward good and punish evil. Right. Case in point, last year, many churches were fined for gathering while protesters were given the freedom to do evil and applauded by mainstream media. Right. Greater persecution is coming to our country sooner or later. And as we look and think upon what has happened and what is happening and look to the horizon in our own day and wonder of what is coming naturally speaking let us not forget the text before us today and how peter and john responded to persecution in this day um, our flesh hates persecution it hates the idea of being persecuted our minds carnally thinking uh, think that 
persecution is bad or that it is a negative thing, right? However, that is not the case. Persecution is not bad. Persecution is not negative. It is good. It is positive, right? It is necessary. And, and if you find that hard to believe, let me persuade you from the scriptures as to the joy of persecution. First of all, in Matthew 5, Jesus gives to us what we call the Beatitudes or the blessed statements. He says, uh, many believers, we, we love and embrace those first seven blessed statements, those Beatitudes. But the, but the last, right? The, the last, some of us, a little harder for us to take, right? In Matthew 5, 10 through 12, Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice, he says, and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In the parallel account of this in Luke chapter 6, verses 22 and 23, Luke records, Blessed are you when people hate you and when they ex exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. That is Jesus. Verse 23 says, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Right? For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the, the prophets. Now that sounds opposite of how we think, right? That, that we, we think that persecution is negative. We don't want to go through it. But what is, what is Luke writing here concerning? Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, Jesus says. Right? And so why should we rejoice? Why should we leap for joy in the day of persecution? A, a few points to that. First of all, because it matures us, right? It matures us as, as believers in Jesus. James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, or patience, as some translations say. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Persecution builds us up. It matures us as believers. Second, persecution waters the seed of the gospel. In John chapter 12, Jesus said, starting in verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life will lose it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. That's right. So unless a, a kernel of wheat is to fall to the ground and die, it remains a single seed, right? Persecution and suffering causes us to die to the things in this life that don't really matter. And it reminds us of the things that absolutely matter. the things that are most important. Persecution water the, waters the seed of the gospel within us and around us. So we should leap for joy, right? Third, when you are persecuted, the church is strengthened and emboldened, right? We see this, Paul writes in Philippians 1.14, and most of the brothers having become confident, how? In the, in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear, right? It's for this reason that the Apostle Paul desires to share in Christ's sufferings in Philippians 3.10, right? It emboldens the church. They were more bold upon hearing about Paul's persecution. Persecution matures the believer. It waters the seed of the gospel, and it strengthens and multiplies the church, as we'll see to today and, and next week. Most importantly, it gives glory to God because it is ultimately his son, Jesus, whom they hate, not you. 
you're just there. All right? 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Right. What does it mean to share Christ's sufferings? It means that Jesus is not here for men to persecute. And so they persecute you. Right. Right. Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of Christ. The very beatings and stonings and whippings and the lashings and the shipwrecks and the snake bites that Paul endured are marks on his body that were meant for Christ. But he's not physically there. He's seated at the right hand of the Father on high. Therefore, they persecute men. Right? It is for these reasons that persecution is good and not bad, right? Positive and not negative, joyful and not sorrowful. As we look to the text today and see the first persecution of the Christian church centered on Peter and John, I think it most beneficial to ask the question, how does Peter and John respond in the face of persecution? With that question before us, we see in verses 13 through 22 that they are obedient in suffering. They are obedient in persecution. In verse 23, we see them gathered to share in their sufferings. In verse 24 through 28, they praise God for persecution. And in verses 29 through 31, they pray for boldness in the face of persecution. So let's look at verse 13 and 14, obedience in persecution. He says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Right. So who are they in, in opposition to what? Right. They are the rulers and people of the elders. He refers to right. Annas whom Jesus appeared before was there, right? Jesus appeared before Annas, right? Jesus appeared before Caiaphas. Caiaphas appeared, uh, he appeared before Caiaphas. In, in Acts chapter 4, this same chapter, verses 7 through 12, as James preached last week, it says, And they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Right. They healed this lame man. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what mean this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, it is by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter and John had a boldness that is unnatural, right? Because it comes from the indwelling Holy Spirit that came as Jesus had promised back in Acts chapter 2. They were astonished that they were uneducated common men. I love it that they were uneducated common men because I am. <laughs> it gives me hope. 
right? Uneducated common men, right? The Jewish council of rulers were the cream of the crop by common uh, Jewish uh, uh, standards, right? They were the greatest minds. They devoted their whole lives to interpreting the scriptures, right? And they must be sitting there with their jaw to the floor, right? Because these men handled the word of God with precision and boldness, right? John and Peter and John were not PhDs. I would be surprised if they had GEDs, right? They're just dumb redneck fishermen by art lingo. That's what they did for a living. They were rough, outcast, Galilean fishermen, right? Uncommon, uneducated men, especially concerning, this is concerning the Old Testament scriptures. And I love this statement. They recognized that they had been with Jesus. James touched on this last week and I had to do it again. I love this. This this is not based on the fact that they were physically seen with Jesus, right? This statement comes from the authority by which they spoke in contrast to the authority by which Jesus spoke, right? After Jesus gave his sermon on the Mount in Matthew, he records, Matthew records these words in Matthew chapter seven at the end of that discourse in verse 28 and 29. It said, Matthew writes, and when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as one of the scribes. Jesus spoke with authority. They knew that he had been teaching for three years, the entire of the whole of his ministry and none could deny the authority by which Jesus spoke. And so they knew that these disciples had been with Jesus based upon the fact that the Holy Spirit through them was speaking with authority. Verse 14, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Right? The Sanhedrin, that is the Jewish council of 71 members made up of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, um, they hated Jesus. They had him murdered, right? Peter just accused them of murdering their Messiah, the one who was to come and save them. He just credited the Lord Jesus Christ with the healing of this man who was standing before them, right? And they put them in jail overnight. Um, So they've had all night to conspire against Peter and John to think about what they're going to do. And and what do they come up with the next day? Nothing. Nothing. They have nothing, right? Verse 15 and through 17 says, But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For a notable sign has been performed through them, and it's evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. (laughs) Even though it is obvious to the Sanhedrin that God has done this work through these men, they can't deny it. It is a notable miracle. They cannot deny it. They still find it necessary to do something to Peter and John to shut them up concerning Jesus because they charged them with killing the author of life. Right? They're blinded by their own sin. Back in verse 10, it said, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Right? They refuse to acknowledge their sin and repent. They cherished their position of power more than obedience to God. Right? They loved the power that they possessed, and they cannot risk these men proclaiming this name whom they killed. Right? This is going to mess up their whole thing. Right? This, is, this is a living illustration of Jesus' words back in John chapter 3, verse 19. And this is the judgment, the light, that is Jesus, according to John 1, 1, Jesus is the light, has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Right? They love the darkness 
their power and authority more than the light, right? The truth of this name, right? It will, it, the, 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 their promised Messiah, he's the light, right? Because their works were evil. They can't have these men speaking this name because it will ruin their whole system of corruption that they got going on. Especially the Sadducees, they were rich, right? They had this whole temple thing down. Think about today meeting a topic such as abortion with the Word of God, right? The, the government will hate you because it tampers with their intellectual idea of population control and it jacks with their future votes. Right? Many common people will hate you because overturning it will cause them to be responsible for their actions. People love darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. The Sanhedrin, they have a huge problem on their hands right here. Huge problem on their hands. Bold men who speak the scriptures with authority, right? One. Two, a notable miracle that can only come from God. Right, that, that everyone knows about and none can deny, including themselves. And the name they proclaim will lead to the loss of their corrupt system. What are they to do? How can they cover all this up? Verse 17, but in order that it may not spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. That's it. Let's warn them. They got nothing against them. Right. Let's warn them. What else can they do? There is no law against miracles. There's no law against good deeds to a poor man. What are they going to do? Verse 18 through 22. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So what do they do? Stop speaking in the name of Jesus. We may very well find ourselves in that predicament someday. And here we find the answer as to how we are to respond, right? And we are to respond in obedience to Jesus. In verses 19 and 20, we see the fulfillment of Jesus' words from Mark 13, 11, as well as other places. It says, and when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you will are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speaks, but the Holy Spirit. Here they are on trial. They tried to trick Jesus with questions and words, right? And their wisdom overwhelmed them, right? What's the most important commandment? Jesus just sums up the two tablets of the law and they're dumbfounded. They just, I don't know, I can, we can't trick him. Here we see the Holy Spirit speaking through Peter as he is on trial. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. There is no way for them to respond to that. You're against God. It's basically what that says, right? You're against God. Whether it's right in the sight of God, or whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge, for we cannot speak of what, cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. The wisdom of these words turns all judgment back on them before God. Many pastors and believers today fold in the face of persecution. For example, Jesus commands we gather as the church. It's not optional. He commands we gather, right? Granted, we, we miss sometimes, but we attend, right? We come together. Christ commands that. 
Last year, many state governments and local governments demanded churches not gather. And, and for a short time, that was OK, right? Until we realized that this COVID thing and these numbers were really, really skewed and not as great as of a threat as everyone had 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 let people no, right? They weren't justifiable. And many pastors defied the government and gathered and were persecuted for it. And they stood their ground. We must obey God rather than man. Right? And while many pastors were afraid of persecution and didn't gather, and they used Romans 13 to justify themselves. Right? Romans 13. 1 through 4 says... Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God, right? So our federal government, our state government, all governments are ordained by God. He has placed them there, and they will stand accountable before God, whether they're righteous or wicked. Therefore, verse 2, whoever resists the authorities resist what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment, Right? Many folded saying, Romans 13, Romans 13, we must be obedient. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. That got flipped around. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Yes, as Christians, we are to be submissive to the governing authorities because they reward good and punish evil. However... Governments today punish good and reward evil. Right? When, when, when those who rule over us would have us to submit to their authority when it defies the, man, the demand, command of scriptures, we can't. Right? And, and here we see a right response from Peter in that very circumstance. He says, You be the judge. You be the judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. You be the judge, whether we should listen to God or to you. But we cannot. Obedience in the face of persecution. Verse 21, and when they had further threatened them, <laughs> they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, right? The people were riled up. There was no way the people would have let them punish them. They'd just seen a crippled man get up and walk and praise God and jump for joy. Right? They let him go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Right? They, they, they feared the crowd who was convinced by the miracle of this man over 40 years old that everyone had seen for a long time begging as a crippled man at the beautiful gate of the temple. They all knew him. Everybody knew this face. In the face of persecution, we also must be obedient to God rather than to man. Right? The proper response to persecution is obedience to God. And secondly, it is together with God's people to share in our sufferings. Look at verse 23. It says, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and elders had said to them. Right. This is a short heading, but it's important to point out the fact that they went straight to their friends. The NASB says to their companions. Right. Not limited to just the other apostles, but certainly not all who had come to Christ, because at this point, I think as MacArthur says that there were likely about 20,000 believers. Right. There were three thousand in Acts chapter two on the day of Pentecost. And in, in the scriptures, it, they, it only counts the men. Right. And so these three thousand have wives and children. Right. There's no telling how many were added to the church that day when you include that in this text. We, we, we see that in this account that there were five thousand who were added to the church. 
There's no telling how many believers there were as these miracles take place and the word of God goes forth, right? Um, Peter and John's companions or friends is likely referring to the uh, many of those 120 who were gathered on the day of Pentecost who had been close for some time, right? They went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them, right? Gathering with the saints after being persecuted allowed for them to be comforted and encouraged by their brothers and sisters in Christ, but on, not only for their sake, right? but, but this is an encouragement for those who weren't present for this trial, right? Again, the saints were made bold by Paul's imprisonment, as I said earlier in Philippians 1.14. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Right, so persecution causes believers to draw together naturally for mutual support. Later on in verses 32 through 35, we see the result of this, right? It is possible that one of the reasons for disunity in the church today is, is lack of persecution or external pressures. Persecution brings a true sense of unity in the church as we share in one another's sufferings. Many churches try and gain unity in the church through false pretenses, right? Such as standing for racial inequality, right? Paul dealt with that in Ephesians 2. We're all one in Christ. There is no racial divide. Now, Paul, Paul dealt with, again, that argument in Ephesians 2, right? We, we are all one in Christ. Some years back, there was a movement to uh, unify the Christian church with the Roman Catholic church. While there are some true believers in the Roman Catholic system, it is a false system. We have nothing in common with the Roman Catholic Church. Right? Any organization that says salvation comes by Christ plus sacraments or Christ plus penance or Christ plus the Pope and their hierarchy, that is a lie, right? Man is saved in Christ alone. Peter just said it all in verse 12. And there is salvation in no other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. MacArthur said, ironically, the early believers had to be commanded to be quiet, while many modern churches and believers have to be commanded to speak. If, if we confronted the world system more aggressively, the resulting opposition would drive us closer together and enrich our mutual dependence on one another, right? That is genuine unity that marked the early believers. That's the genuine unity that marked the early believers. Are we to seek out persecution? No. No, right? That's ridiculous and unwise. And there are some that do that. I, there are some that make themselves suffer by beating themselves and all kinds of weird things, right? In the name of, of Jesus, they're not doing anything, right? We don't suffer on purpose. We don't go out looking for persecution. That's, that's foolish, right? Ignorance does not honor God. Obedience does. If we are persecuted or suffer out of obedience, we honor God. If we suffer on purpose, we are just foolish, right? And Acts 17.30 says that the times of ignorance are over. We gather all the more in times of persecution and suffering to strengthen and be strengthened. This is what Paul did. He gathered with the people of God immediately after his persecution, this trial. Third, we respond to persecution by praising God and being thankful. We see this in verses uh, 24 through 28. It says, And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? 
The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the prophets of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. We respond to persecution in praise and thanksgiving to God as we see here. They praise the Lord. Lord in verse 24 comes from the Greek word despotes. It's used five times in the New Testament and it means absolute master. Absolute master. I like how the ESV translated that sovereign Lord. Right? How is it that they as well as we can be thankful in the face of persecution? It's because persecution is working for us an eternal way to glory. Right? Second Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. This is how we do it. (laughs) We know what awaits us. Here we see believers singing praises from Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2. While believers receive external, uh, eternal glory for the persecution and suffering they face, the persecutors are storing up wrath for the day of judgment. Right? It is they who gather together against the Lord and against his anointed Christ, whom he we represent in this earth. Right. Verse 27 and 28. For truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the prophets of Israel to do whatever your hand And your plan had predestined to take place. I love the word predestined. It comes from the Greek word perizo. It means to determine beforehand. Right? This reminds you and I, MacArthur says, that God is the supreme historian who wrote all history before it ever began. I love that, right? that God is the supreme historian who wrote all history before it ever began. The, the, the persecutors have done their worst and they have only succeeded in fulfilling God's eternal plan. This is why Psalm 7610 says, Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. In the face of persecution, we praise God and we give him thanks because he is working all things for our good and for his glory. Right? He is sovereign over all the affairs of man. Lastly, we, in the face of persecution, are to follow Peter and John's lead by praying for boldness. We pray for boldness. Verses 29 through 31. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. All right. Lord, look upon their threats. Look upon their threats and and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness, with confidence. Right. Right. Look upon their threats that are the result of their guilt. Grant to your servants. Some translations say bond servants. I like that better. Right? This this comes from the Greek word doulos. We brought out many times and it looks back to verse 24. Right? Sovereign Lord in verse 24. They acknowledge Jesus as absolute master and themselves as slaves bondservants to the Lord Jesus Christ. They petition the Lord as his slaves to see these threats and grant to them to speak God's holy and errant word with all boldness, with all confidence. Parasia, freedom in speaking, unreservedness in speech is what they're asking the Lord for. Verses 
They stood in defiance of the leaders of their nation in obedience to the word of God. They were persecuted for their actions. They left they, and they go and they tell their companions who praised and gave thanks to God with them and petitioned the Lord for more. That's the spirit at work in the life of the believer. I fear that in our day, because of lack of persecution, we cowered away from speaking the truth in the fear of persecution. I've done it. I've done it. I've missed an opportunity to be obedient for the sake of a future glory. Right? For my own growth and maturity. I, I've missed honoring God for fear of what man thought about me. Sounds silly right now. But um, it sure feels different when we're out there, doesn't it? First Peter three thirteen through 17 says, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than doing evil. Church, we ought to pray often in this way. Give us boldness to proclaim your truth. Right? Asking the Lord to grant us by the Spirit the ability to speak with confidence. Verse 30 and 31. While you stretched out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus... And when they had prayed, the place where they, which they were, were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with, with boldness. Right? The Lord answers this kind of prayer. Right? The, the Lord answers the prayers that are according to his will and bring him glory. And the Lord did answer their prayer. He did answer their prayer. They did continue to speak with all boldness. And it is because of their faithfulness in that day that you and I have the truth of the gospel and receive salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone today. Because of their faithfulness, right? If we fail to speak someone will fail to hear. If we fail to live righteously, many will not see our good works and give glory to God. Right? In conclusion, church, we are to count it all joy when we meet various trials, trials of various kinds, just as they did. We are to live righteously as they did. No charge could be brought against them that day, right? We are to speak boldly the name of Jesus in the face of persecution because there is no other name by which man can be saved. The name of Jesus is an offensive name. 2,000 years later, and it is still an offensive name. Why? Because the gospel brings us face to face with our sin. The gospel puts man in the same position it put the Sanhedrin in, in the text before us, right? You only have two options when you're confronted with your own sin. Repent, think differently, and believe on Jesus and follow his commands. Right? Repent means to think differently. That's one response. When we see our sin... We acknowledge our sin, we grieve our sin over our sin because we grieve God, and we lay it at the feet of the cross of Christ. We believe on Him, He forgives us our sin, and we live a life being sanctified in His Word. Or, 
we do like they did, right? We do like they did. They hated the name of Jesus. We'll hate him because we love our sin. We must face our sin. We can either grieve over our sin now and lay them at the foot of the cross, or we can die in our sins and receive the eternal punishment for them. When we grieve or relent our sins and believe on Jesus, the greatest miracle happens. He places all our sins, past, present, and future, on His cross, where He received the wrath of God for the sin of all who would believe on Him, while at the same time transferring to our account His perfect righteousness that we may grow in righteousness and obedience to his words. That's the good news of the gospel, right? He takes the worst of me and you and gives you the best of him. The best of himself, and it's by faith. It's by believing. The Jewish council had that opportunity in chapter 3, right? John, or excuse me, Peter and John said in verse 17 of chapter 3, And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, gave them the benefit of the doubt, as did your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore. That means change your mind about Jesus. Right? And turn back that your sins may be blotted out. But they loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. They loved their sin, their position of power and wealth more than they loved their promised Messiah. Therefore, they are not worthy of him. They had to be warned. They had to be told the truth. And someone had to be the messenger. Right? Some will believe and be added to the church. And an eternal re 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 reward is given to those who who plant seed, who water seed, who reap seed. It doesn't matter. There's great reward in heaven for those things. The word must be proclaimed to all, but many will hate you because of the truth, right? And Jesus warned us of that in John 15, verses uh, 18 and 19. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world... Therefore, the world hates you. Fear not, church. You are not of the world. Be obedient. Draw encouragement from one another. Praise God and give Him thanks for all things. And pray for boldness to proclaim His name. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank You for today. I thank You for this account that we can be bold and not fear persecution and trials that come into our lives, but we can know that this life is temporal, it's temporary, it's like a vapor that's here today and gone tomorrow, but there is that which is eternal. And you are working our sufferings and, and you are working our persecutions to a future glory for us, to a future reward for us, and we're grateful. Help us to set our minds on things that are heavenly. Help us to set our minds on Christ, to press on toward the mark and the high calling of Christ. And help us to set our affections upon you this day, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.